Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church online service. If you're viewing us on YouTube, we invite you to visit our website where links to our prior services may be found along with other pertinent information about the church. The link to our website is found in the comment section below. While we miss you being here in person, we are blessed that you have joined us online. At this time, I would like to share with you a song. just a few announcements. If you need assistance buying food or other necessities, please contact Brother Oscar, Becky, or me to discuss your situation. In this shelter-in-place environment, please use our website to share your needs with us. I am in the process of compiling a list of facilities that may be able to help with food and other important necessities. And you may also dial 211 for information about any specific needs that you may have. We do understand that some of you are not receiving an income at this time. However, if you are in a position to give to the church, we have different tithing options available to you. You may mail your tithes and offerings to the church at the address listed in the comments section below. You may have your bank send your tithes directly to the church, or you may go to the church website and tithe through our PayPal link. Also, each week we have a Wednesday evening Bible study, and everyone is welcome to join us on Facebook. We are currently in the book of Luke, in the 10th chapter. If you would like to be added to those who join us on Facebook, please text Brother Frank or contact us through the website comments. Also, we are still in the midst of the Annie Armstrong 
Easter offering emphasis. With over 273 million people in North America who do not know Jesus, the mission of spreading the gospel has never been so urgent as during this COVID-19 pandemic. Thousands of missionaries across the U.S. and Canada share the good news about Jesus with those who have no hope. The, two, the 2020 mission offering week of prayer is on our website, and you can pray for the missionaries that are listed there, as well as all North American missionaries who are sharing the gospel on the front lines. If you're able, you may also contribute to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Call me and let me know if you are sending part of your donation for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Now, I am personally excited about the new sermon series that we are beginning today. I pray that you will join us each week as we learn about the seven churches spoken of in the book of Revelation. Thank you. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come today praying that you and your will is being accomplished here in our country during this time. We ask that you be with us during this time of worship, that your, your power and, and love and glory will shine forth in the message, that we will learn more about you and how great you really are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As Susan mentioned, we are starting a new series today, and it's titled A Tale of Seven Churches. Now, a lot of times when people or ministers um, get into the book of Revelation, they spend it in, in other areas, but this is quite important. Now, Many of us are familiar with the Revelation of John. You know, the book of Revelation, that's the last book of the New Testament, or, or at least we think we are. Most people just breeze through it, and they, they tend to pause only when they get to the sensational bits, the, the, the things about dragons and beasts with seven heads and ten horns, or, or locusts the size of Volkswagens, but for most of us, what we know about Revelation is what we've read in the Left Behind series or the late great planet Earth. However, the book of Revelation, what we need to understand and, and are going to learn is that it was originally addressed to a group of believers who didn't have Tim LaHaye or Hal Lindsay to guide them or confuse them, you know, whatever the case may be. So what I want to do today is start with just a little background of the, the, this letter that John is being told to write to the churches. The Bible says that the author was someone by the name of John. That's what uh, Revelation starts out with. But it doesn't spell out specifically that it was John the Apostle. Yet, there's strong, early, and consistent testimony which confirms that the Apostle John was the writer of the book of Revelation. But regardless of the authorship, what the writer was doing when he wrote it is used a style that's called apocalyptic. That word apocalyptic originates from a Greek word, word which means the unveiling. In other words, something was hidden and now it's seen. And this style of writing was very popular in the period between the Old and New Testaments. 
because you have to remember, it was during that time for over 500 years that the Jewish people had been living under rule of occupying armies. And they were looking forward and they looked forward to the day when the Messiah would come and deliver his people. Now, as we look at this book, there are two views as to when it was actually written. Now, some believe that it was written during Nero's reign, about 68 AD, while others believe it was written about the time of Domitian's reign, about 96 AD. Now, the people who are, are supporting the idea that it was written during Nero's reign, what they are doing are trying to put a round peg in a square hole. They want to relegate the book's prophetic fulfillment so that it would happen before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, believing that Jerusalem's destruction was the first phase of Christ's second coming. Now the view that's held by the church today and most commentators is that Revelation was written somewhere between 90 and 95 AD, about 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. At this time, the emperor in Rome was Domitian. He was the first ruler to institute emperor worship, meaning that he believed that he was God and insisted that he be worshiped as such by all his subjects. Each year, his subjects were required to appear at a temple and offer a pinch of incense and utter the words, Caesar is Lord, which for Christians sort of posed a little problem because they believed that only Jesus was Lord. So what happened? They refused to obey the edict. Now, Domitian considered this an act of treason and had those who refused to recognize him as God either executed, imprisoned, or exiled. Well, it appears <clears throat> that John was in that last group because he was exiled to a penal colony on the island of Patmos during this time, only being released after Domitian had been assassinated. John even says that he was there because, as, is, as it's written, of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, which traditionally has been accepted to mean that he had been exiled to the island because of his faith. And if you want to know what it was like before you got to that island, Sir William Ramsey writes, John's banishment would be preceded by scourging, marked by perpetual fetters, scantily clothing, insufficient food, sleeping on bare ground, and probably worked under the lash of a military overseer. So John didn't have an easy time. And it's on this rocky, barren island that John has his vision, that he writes the book of Revelation. So let's look at, at what, we're, what we're going to be talking about. In Revelation 1, starting down in verse 10 through 11, it says, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, there's a couple of points I need to, to make at, at, you know, here at the beginning. First, no one has established what John means when he says, I was in the Spirit. 
Some contend that he was in some kind of mystical trance-like state, while others just say he was simply enjoying private worship. And next, that phrase, on the Lord's Day. Most believe that it means it was the first day of the week, therefore John was worshiping. It's, it's little things like that when you study Revelation that will throw you off track when, when you, you, you try to read it in a way that uh, you, you're not familiar with. Now, I don't know what it was specifically for John, but what I know is it doesn't matter. What I do know is that he was in a position to be spiritually open and receptive to what Jesus would have him hear. And it was while he was in this position that Jesus told him to record what he saw and heard. After which, he was to send the vision to seven specific churches located in the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. He was to send it to Ephesus and to Smyrna, which in today is Izmir, uh, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, if, if I could display a map of the area where these churches are located, you would see that, that they almost make a circle. Uh, it, it was getting the letter from one church to the other would have been a circulous route. But why seven churches? Why not three, or 10, or four? Well, we don't know. There were certainly more churches in the area than these seven. Some theorize that the letter was addressed to, to these individual churches because John had a special relationship with them. Maybe he had preached there, or, or knew the pastors, or some of the members. If so, they would have been, they would be more receptive to receiving his letter. Now, others have suggested that seven is the number of completeness, and therefore the seven churches represent all churches. Or, they were the largest churches in the area, so the letters were being sent to them and then those churches would distribute them to the smaller churches. Regardless, when you study the book of Revelation, you come to understand that not only do these letters apply to seven specific churches, but these churches may represent periods in church history. For example, Ephesus, would describe the early church, Smyrna, the persecuted church, Pergamum, the popularized church, Thyatira, the Dark Ages, Sardis, the Reformation period, Philadelphia, the revived church, and Laodicea, the lukewarm warm church. Now, if that's not confusing enough, there's one other way that we can view these churches, and that's indicative of the various churches today. In other words, we can find churches here and now that mirror each of these seven churches, just like Ephesus or Sardis or Laodicea. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at each of these churches historically and see how this letter applies to that particular situation. How it might be an analogy of a particular period in church history, and what warnings and advice we can find also for Grace Fellowship here in 2020. Now, turn with me to Revelation 120. Here, it says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches 
and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. In this verse, in verse 20, we need to understand what Jesus is doing with John at this point. Jesus is clarifying what John saw earlier in verses 12 to 13 and and in verse 16, where Jesus, where John sees Jesus standing amidst seven golden lampstands holding seven stars in his hand. In verse 20, Jesus explains that those stars represent the angels of the seven churches, which may have clarified it for John, but you know, really that that doesn't do too much for us today. But as we study it, and as you look at different um, uh, information and commentators, you'll see that there are several explanations clarifying just who these angels were. But first, we need to understand that the word angel in the Greek simply means messenger. That's it. The word in the Greek that's used for angel simply means messenger. Therefore, some suggest that these seven angels were human messengers who were gathered to take John's message to their respective churches. Now, linguistically, that makes sense you know, to the seven messengers of the seven churches. That, that sounds good. But when we get into the letters themselves, it would appear that whoever these angels were, they were more than just simple messengers. In all other in- instances in Revelation where we read the word angel, it means a heavenly being. And with that in mind, there have been some who have suggested that perhaps these angels were guardian angels, heavenly beings who protected the individual churches and who would be held accountable if a church went wrong. If that's true, then each church had its own angel to guide and protect it. Now, even though it's the angel who's mentioned in the opening of each letter, it's obvious that it's the members of the church who are being addressed. Now, another idea that's been presented is that since both Greeks and Jews believe, believed that every earthly thing had a heavenly counterpart, The angel being addressed is the ideal of the church, the way that it's supposed to be. And it's also been suggested that the angels of these churches were actually their human overseers or pastors, and that the letters were addressed to these spiritual shepherds. Now, this particular view is backed up in Malachi 2.7 that says, for the lips of a priest ought to be preserved, ought to preserve knowledge, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth. In the Greek Old Testament, the word used for messenger is the same word used here in Revelation for angels. And traditionally, most scholars believe that these seven angels were the bishops or pastors of these seven churches, which has serious implications for us pastors. Each pastor is responsible for the individual behavior and obedience. You know, they they, they are responsible for their individual behavior and obedience as a believer. Yet, as the overseer of Grace Fellowship, I'm not only responsible for my obedience and behavior, but I'm also responsible for your collective obedience and behavior. 
Since the seven stars are held in the right hand of Jesus, that indicates that the pastor's primary responsibility is not to you, not to his congregation as a whole or to any one member of the congregation in particular, but his primary responsibility is to God. In 2020, the role of the pastor doesn't have the respect in the community or even in the church that it had, let's say, 25 years ago. But that doesn't mean that it's any less important. My role in this church is to serve and speak for God. Psalms 105, 15 says, Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. Now, let's go back a minute to Revelation uh, to here in the first chapter to verses 12 to 13. It says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. There, there's three things that I need for you to understand in these verses. First, the lampstands were gold. You know, they weren't iron, they weren't brass or silver, they were gold. Now, that might not mean anything to us today, you know, outside of an economic statement, but it had a different connotation 2,000 years ago. Because when you say gold, the context of gold when this letter was written was not only of worth, but it was of purity. Today, society has declared the church irrelevant. And some believers feel that they don't even need the church anymore that they can just worship alone, you know, go out in the yard or in a field and just be in tune with God. But you know what? God, in his infinite wisdom, chose to use the church. You know, we, we sometimes see it as imperfect, but it's his instrument for change for the world. That is what he chose to use. Listen to Paul as he describes how the church was to look. Ephesians 5, 27. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. That certainly is not a description of the church today. As long as the church is made up of people, it will have stains and blemishes, but the ultimate plan is for it to be perfect. The second thing we need to see in these verses is not only was the lampstand gold, it was a gold lampstand. Yeah, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know what a lampstand is? It's a stand for a lamp. The church is not a lamp. It's a lamp stand. The light doesn't come from the stand. It comes from the lamp. Now, there's two ways that are viewed in this meaning of the light that comes from the lamp. First, Jesus is the light. And this is, in, this is verified from passages like John 9, 5, saying, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And in John 8, 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When a church no longer preaches Jesus, as the Son of God, who was born of a virgin, 
died on a cross and was resurrected on the third day offering forgiveness, then they're no longer a church. They have no light. Now the second meaning is that believers are the light. And correctly, Matthew 5.14 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Which can be interpreted to mean that Jesus left believers to be the light of the world. That the light that shines from the church is from the individual believers and it's our responsibility to shine. Either way, when the light, whether coming from Christ or Christians, is removed from the lampstand, that lampstand is worthless. It's of no longer any use. Now, as I close out, the last thing I want to explain about lampstands is about lampstands. Now that, that may seem strange, but within the framework of the scriptures, when the word lampstand is used, Jews immediately thought of what? The menorah. Exodus 25, 31 to 32. Make a lampstand of pure gold. Hammer out its base and shaft and make its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms of one piece with them. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three on one side and three on the other. Now, Revelations 1.12 isn't talking about seven lamps that make up the lampstand. It's talking about seven individual lampstands. Each lampstand has a un unity, yet it is connected to itself. Within the individual church, there needs to be unity. We, as a body of believers, need to be united with Christ in the center. He is the unifying force. But there's also needs to be unity within the church as a whole. What I'm talking about here is the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, Bible Churches, Pentecostal Churches, Baptist Churches, etc., etc. There must be unity in the lampstand and unity with the lampstands. And as we study about the seven churches and learn what God wants us to understand, we will then have the responsibility to share this knowledge. Revelations 22.10 commands us, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we get into this book of Revelation, we will be learning things that uh, we, we didn't know. And, and in fact, every time we read it, we learn something new. That is why this book, the Bible, is a living book. It changes as we change. It matures as we mature. And we pray, Lord, as we go through this series, that everyone will understand the importance of knowing that you, Lord, are the center of our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.